purchasing a firearm is much more difficult these days. Uh, so there's no longer a, an operational or safety reason to safeguard a member shield. So we instituted a new policy when a member of the service has their duty status changed for a medical reason, includes a, a mental health reason, uh, we no longer remove their shields. They can keep their shield. So when they're at work, they don't have that visual stigma of being different than their coworkers. And just go through, can you just run through the process of um, when you strip uh, an officer of their gun? Can you just go through the process a little bit of what what does that look like? When, when does that happen? So the, the facts can vary depending upon the unique circumstances in each individual case. But generally, a member of the service will come to the attention of our medical division. And we have a team of clinicians there. We have psychologists. We have a deputy director and a director of psychological evaluation. Uh, and the whole thing is overseen by our deputy chief surgeon, who is a board certified psychiatrist. Uh, and what will happen is an assessment will be done on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and the assessments may vary. Uh, it'll depend upon the unique situation that the member is involved in. And members come to our attention for a whole variety of reasons. Like I said, they could be a self-referral. It could be a referral from a coworker or a supervisor. It could be the result of a trauma debriefing after a critical incident. Uh, so when we become aware that a member uh, requires some mental health treatment and or medication, our psychologists will conduct an evaluation. That may include uh, looking at collateral information, like speaking to family and friends, uh, consulting with the individual member's uh, personal physician uh, to conduct a more wholesome assessment of the situation, and then make a determination on a case-by-case -case basis. And like I said, uh, it, it's only done if uh, the psychologist, uh, as, as and reviewed by uh, the deputy director and director of psychological evaluation concur uh, if there's an indication that it's necessary because that person may be a danger to themselves or others. And just speak about modified duty a little bit. So what does that entail? Because I, I know that if perhaps you, you, you're, you're a partner with someone and you probably put on modified duty that there is a, you know, some sense of um, you're going to believe that there's a stigma attached to you. You may be asked questions. What does that look like when someone is put on modified? Sure. So when we, we talk about the uniformed members of the service, police officers, uh, people who are full duty, carry firearms, and conduct enforcement and public service operations, uh, there are times when it may be necessary to change somebody's duty status. So when we're talking about a medical condition or a mental health condition, uh, that prevents that person from carrying out their duties uh, as a police officer, we change their duty status to restricted duty. And restricted meaning uh, they're, they're still paid, they still have their insurance. However, because of a medical or mental health condition, uh, they cannot fully perform uh, as expected as a police officer, so we change their duty status. Now, once their duty status is changed, uh, that status will be constantly reevaluated by the psychologist in the medical division in consultation with the uh, member's uh, uh, personal practitioner. Uh, and we will also make a determination uh, as to where that member uh, works. So in some cases, the member may stay in their permanent command. Uh, in some cases, they may get transferred. Uh, it all depends upon the staffing at that command, uh, perhaps staffing in other commands where uh, we may need additional personnel, also taking into account kind of the causes of the individual's issues. So if uh, an issue, uh, if an individual is having some issues where they work, it may be in their best interest to move them. But if they have a support network uh, in their current uh, command of assignment, they may stay there. So again, this is part of that evaluation that is done by the medical professionals uh, when assessing uh, what should happen, what the course of treatment should look like, and then what follow-up actions need to be taken. And let's go through after a traumatic event, and I know I've been at the hospital after traumatic events, and I want to commend the work that ESU does, because I think, I think that I say the right, the right? E e EAU. EAU, I'm sorry. EAU does, because I know that they've done some very important work at the scene. Um, so at the scene, just take me quickly through what they would do. Uh, and what is the follow-up after? Um, do officers go back out into the street after a traumatic event? 
Um, you know, what does that look like? Do they come back to work the next day? Does EAU follow up after that? Uh, just take us through that. So uh, all of those can occur. So depending upon the nature of a traumatic event, uh, one of our psychologists will conduct a trauma debriefing of the members involved, uh, but also our employee assistance unit will respond to the scene when the event occurs uh, and consult with and provide services to everybody involved. So for example, in, in the case, uh, let's say, of a suicide, the most tragic of, of these type of events, uh, they will meet with family and friends and offer their services. Uh, they will also meet with and speak to coworkers uh, and including the police officers who respond to the event who may not know the individual but are nonetheless impacted by what they've seen and the emotional trauma of what they've dealt with. So EAU will work uh, with all of those people who are affected and will stay in touch with them for extended periods of time and check in with them months, even in many cases years later, uh, to, to see if they have any needs and uh, they require any services. In addition, uh, our family assistance unit uh, works closely with employee assistance uh, to uh, tend to family needs. So we have many cases where the uh, families may need some extended services and they will help arrange those as well. I'm going to ask a few more questions and get to my colleagues. I know they're waiting patiently. Um, so the bill we're hearing today requires, obviously, the department to contract with or employ clinicians. Um, and obviously, we're trying to get at the heart of what I believe is the issue around trust. So all the things you said today sounds really good. Um, but we know, based on our conversations with members of the service, that they're um, there arguably is, are some issues around trust and could we trust the department not to take away our weapon and our livelihood as officers uh, if we do report uh, mental health, we have a mental health uh, issue. Uh, what are some of the advantages of having these clinicians uh, and can you speak to uh, any disadvantages you may believe these clinicians may serve by having them in-house? and what could we do to minimize those, those disadvantages? Yeah, I, you know, just on the clinicians, I mean, I don't, I don't, I can't imagine any disadvantages to having them. I, I think it all, it's all value added when, you, when you're talking about uh, people who have a skill that uh, allows them to interact with people who have, you know, they're depressed or they have some emotional challenges. I think those, that's all, you have to have people who, who and, and along with our psychologists who provide that support. So I don't see a downside to it. Uh, and again, I'm not sure how widespread the challenges are with people who decide that they don't want to take advantage of the services or they 